Okay, hey everyone, good morning. I am not a very spontaneous person, but uh, we're kind of doing this on the fly because I found out today that tomorrow at noon, my father is going to be inducted into the University of Delaware Track and Field Hall of Fame. Um, and he's got extra tickets. So we're going to make a surprise visit uh, and uh, drive up there. I'm, I'm videoing this on Saturday evening so it can be ready, prepared for you all on Sunday morning. And today we're going to dive into, in our series on the Holy Spirit, this is going to be uh, number seven on the authority of the Holy Spirit in and through the believer. The authority of the Holy Spirit in and through the believer. Um, a lot of my messages, I try to go very deep so that uh, picture the schoolhouses in early colonial America where you had first grade through 12th grade in the same room. So the teacher in presenting whatever subject has got to keep it simple enough for those in first and second grade to understand and yet go deep enough uh, for those in 11th and 12th grade to get something meaty out of um, the presentation. So though a lot of my messages incorporate a lot of scripture, um, the simplicity of the theme is simply the authority of the Holy Spirit that resides in the believer. We're going to look at a number of verses today to support that. And my hope is that with every message, of course, uh, we can keep things simple enough for those who are younger in the faith, and yet deep enough for those who are 20, 30, 40 years walking with Jesus are still able to connect, uh, to learn, and to really be able to dive in deeper than they ever have before. So uh, opening statement, I'll just say this, our level of faith is directly related to the degree of God's word dwelling in our hearts. So we're going to look at what the word says that we possess in terms of spiritual authority. And I want to start off with Genesis chapter 1, just a reminder, because in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over all of creation. So man's original purpose was to co-rule with God over all of creation. And we lost that calling because of our disobedience, our rebellion against God in, in choosing instead of submission to God, we, we chose to listen to and thus submit to Satan. And that disobedience, that sin, that rebellion caused us to forfeit the original purpose and plan that God had for human beings. So here's my main points today, and you can see those in your handout. Number one, Jesus is the source of all authority in the universe. Jesus is the source of all authority in the universe. And I could reference Romans chapter 13, verse 1 for that, but we're not going to go there. Secondly, we humans have no authority except that which is delegated to us by Christ. Humans have no authority except that which is delegated to them by Jesus. Number three, Jesus only trusts us with authority to the degree that we fulfill three conditions, three qualifications. First, we are in submission to him. Secondly, we are knowledgeable regarding his will. And third, we are willing to obey. Submission, knowledge of his will, and obedience. And you'll see point number four is just a reiteration of this submission. Hearing his will, knowing his will, and obedience are the three keys in gaining and exercising spiritual authority. So the first passage I want you to turn to with me is Colossians chapter 1, 
15 through 18. Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 18. I'm going to go ahead and read this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or the prototype over all creation. I don't I don't see, I don't read into that that he is a created being. He's always existed. He's part of the Trinity, but he is the prototype of humans. Humans have been made in the image of Jesus. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn. There it is again, the prototype from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So Jesus is the supreme authority over all created things, whether visible or invisible. And any authority that we have is delegated to us by Jesus and finds its source is entirely dependent upon Jesus as the ultimate creator of all things. So again, back to the three conditions, submission to his, in this particular case, I would use the word headship, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. So submission to his lordship, to his headship, and unifying our thoughts, our words, our actions to be aligned with his will. So the hand only exercises uh, its, its purpose under the authority of the head. The head is the one that makes the decisions, that makes the calls. The hand must be in submission. Uh, It must have a knowledge through nerve impulses of the will of its authority, of the head. And it must be willing to obey. And we see the, the perfect fulfillment of those three conditions with any part of our body. As we consciously give direction uh, from from our head, from our mind. So this passage speaks about all things created by Jesus, for Jesus, and are even sustained by Jesus moment by moment. The atoms of the universe, the atoms of our bodies are not only created by Jesus, for Jesus, but are currently sustained The molecules are holding together because of the authority of Jesus Christ. Um, And he has demonstrated supremacy uh, through the resurrection of the dead. So the greatest secondary power in the universe is perhaps the power of Satan, the power of sin, the power of death. So when Jesus defeated death, he revealed that his power was the supreme power of the universe. That there is no other power in the created world that is higher than the authority that Jesus has. He has authority even over death itself. Okay? Now, here's the second uh, verse, and this is going to be Ephesians chapter 1. It's a prayer that Paul is praying for the church of Ephesus. I want to begin in verse 18. We're going to see a very similar theme. And again, remember, we're focusing on the authority of the Holy Spirit in the believer. The authority that's been given to us by nature of our relationship, our connection with Christ, who is Lord, who is the head, who is uh, our master. Verse 18. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power. It's incomparable. Great power for us who believe. That power is the same as his mighty strength, 
which he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly realm. So we're talking about the resurrection power used to raise Christ from the dead. And he is now far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things, all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the benefit of the church, which is his body. And I'll stop there. So again, our four basic principles. First, Jesus is the source of all authority in the universe. And is the, as the supreme authority in the universe, he is over all things, both visible and invisible, both in this present age and also the age to come. And we humans have no authority, have no power except that which is delegated to us by Jesus. He is the source. Jesus is the head of the church. The church is Jesus' body. If you'll look in verse 22, it says, God has placed all things under Jesus' feet. Well, if Jesus is the head and we are the body, then all things placed under Jesus' feet means that we, the body, the church, have authority in Christ and all other things. De demonic spirits are under the feet of the church. The church has authority over all other names that are named, over all rulers and authorities, powers, and dominions. Verse 21. So this authority, again, may only be exercised to the degree that the church and individual believers are in submission to the head, are in submission to Christ, listen to know his will uh, and, and execute that will with obedience. To execute and obey his instructions. So submission, listening to know his will, and obedience are the three keys to gaining and exercising spiritual authority. Um, we are simply stewards of his authority and the amazing thing is that Jesus has decided not to work independently, but he uses this analogy that he is the head, we are the body, he chooses to work through his bride, the church, through us. Jesus wants to do his work in this world through the church, not apart from the church, but through the church. And in order to accomplish that work, he shares with us He's willing to share with us a portion of his authority so that we can be successful. Now, our job is to advance the mission of Christ and to enforce the victory of Christ in this world by his authority and in his character, with his character, the fruits of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. Both are absolutely necessary for success. Now, I'm going to say this next thing. I've been thinking about this. It's somewhat convicting. Many problems exist in the world, in the church, and in our own lives because we permit them. We permit them to exist because we fail to do anything about it. We fail to exercise the authority that Jesus has given us through the Holy Spirit because of our connection with the head, because we are his body. And let me give you an example of this. I was just thinking about a policeman. So a policeman in and of himself has no authority. The moment he takes off the uniform, the moment he, he takes off the badge and he becomes a civilian and he goes home, he has no authority. What gives him authority is the law or the state, you know, the badge, the, the uniform behind the man. So the policeman is a delegated authority of a higher power. But what are the three conditions that every policeman must uphold 
which are simultaneously true for every believer. And here they are again. We told you over and over again, simple, and yet we're going deep. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will speak to you about your context as we uh, go over these things several times. Here are the three conditions. The police officer must be, must be in submission to a higher authority. The moment they step out from under that submissive uh, attitude and they begin to do their own thing, the law can pull back that a delegated authority and can fire them. All right. Secondly, they must have a knowledge of the law because they don't have authority in and of themselves. They are representing authority. So they must have an intimate knowledge of the will of of the source of their authority, whether it's the law books, the state, you know. And finally, they must be in obedience. They must be willing to obey that higher authority very closely with submission. Okay, so that's an example that directly illustrates uh, these spiritual principles with the church and Christ the head. Now, <clears throat> no one is fit to be a delegated authority unless they first learn how to function under authority. I'll give you an example with this. It's thinking about Abishai. Uh, if I was to leave the house, the parents are to leave the house, we are going to leave Abishai in charge. There is, um, he has no right to be granted a portion of his parents' authority unless he has first proven consistently to be in submission to his father, to have a clear understanding of his father's heart and will, and has proven himself time and again to be obedient. And I give you an example. Let's say um, Abishai is left in charge uh, from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon, and uh, parents leave the house, and he, um, he has delegated authority. So when he gives this command of the rooms, all bedrooms must be cleaned before uh, we sit down to eat lunch. Now, he knows from previous uh, experiences that his father has repeatedly, daily, consistently uh, made this a standard in the household. Rooms must be clean before we eat lunch. So he is not exercising, he's not giving this command apart from the will of the Father. He is giving this command because he knows the heart of the Father, all right? Secondly, he's demonstrated submission in his own life to the Father. And that is, that is why he has been granted a measure of authority to act as the Father's representative in this particular case temporarily. All right. So he has no um he has no right to expect obedience to his command in the name of the father. And he's he's going to command them, he's going to tell them in dad's name, in the father's name, and he's going to exercise this with authority because he is uh a son under authority and has demonstrated submission and obedience and a knowledge of the father's will in his own life. So no one is fit to be de a delegated authority unless we first know how to function under authority. That's the test for promotion. Uh, and if we can't learn these three principles, submission, knowledge of his will, and obedience, God cannot trust us with authority. He will not raise us up. Now, what does this mean practically? I want to talk about what this means practically in regards to Satan and sin. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, and some of these I wrote out, some of them I just listed in your handout. So you can jot down and you can still follow along in your, in your handout. Luke 10, 19, Jesus um, has, has given a measure of power and authority. He sent out the disciples. They're going to return. Verse, uh, verse 17, let me read this. The 72 disciples returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They had authority over demonic spirits. And Jesus replied, yes, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
And I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Jesus gave his disciples authority over all demonic spirits, over Satan himself. And we see this in the next passage that I listed. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves to God. There's the submission piece. We must be under authority to exercise authority. The only authority that exists is found in Jesus as its source. Any authority that we are able to operate in is delegated to us. We've got to earn it. It comes from relationship with the head but simply because we've made a profession of faith and we've been born again does not necessarily mean just because Abishai is my son does not mean if his behavior is one of, of inconsistency, of half the time he's disobedient, he's rebellious, he, he doesn't obey. He is not going to be a candidate that I, I'm going to choose another child to raise up to delegate my authority in my absence. Same is true with us. Submit yourselves to God. Oppose, or many versions say resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He'll flee from you. It doesn't say he'll flee from Jesus. It says he'll flee from the believer. Because inside the believer is the third person of the Trinity, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has authority. We are, when we are in right relationship with the Holy Spirit, when we are in submission to God, and we resist the enemy. We oppose Satan. He must flee because we are exercising the same authority that Jesus uh, had that was resurrection authority from the dead is being exercised through us toward the enemy. And the enemy has to obey. All names, all powers, all dominions, all authorities are under the feet of Christ, who is the body, who are the feet. We are the church. Jesus is the head. The church is the body all demonic spirits under the feet of the body. Key is we must be under authority to receive and exercise authority. Now, again, let me reemphasize this. I believe that many times conditions exist because we permit them to exist. We often wait for Jesus to do something, but the head has no power to execute its authority. It relies upon the body to execute the mission. And so Jesus, in a desire to incorporate us, goes back to Genesis chapter one. Remember, we are called to be co-heirs, co-rulers with Jesus over all of creation. So Jesus is training us. He's training us now to co-rule over all created things by limiting the extent to which he acts and choosing instead to exercise authority through his body, the church. So we often wait for Jesus to do something while he is waiting for us to get in alignment with him, to cooperate, submission, alignment with his will, obedience, and to exercise the delegated authority that is available to us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, Do not give place. That word place means territory. It means space. Don't give territory to the devil. Oftentimes, we will make a covenant with Satan, a covenant of agreement, because we permit a certain sin. We've allowed a certain thing into our life, into our house. We don't resist it. If we resist Satan, he will flee. But we don't resist. We allow uh, the demonic realm access through compromise, through worldliness, through sin, through disobedience. We permit many problems to exist because we refuse to do anything about it. So I just want to encourage you and I, this is another re reminder a refresher. Don't settle for less. We don't need to settle for defeat. We have delegated authority over all powers of the demonic realm. Um, 
And 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4 is another verse that supports this theme. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power, power from on high, heavenly power to demolish strongholds. What kind of strongholds? Sinful strongholds, satanic strongholds, worldly strongholds, sin, Satan, and the world. We have power to overcome all of the power of the enemy if we exercise the authority that's been delegated to us. Addictions, idols, fear, anxiety, worry, sickness, bitterness, you name it, we have the power to tear down strongholds of sin and Satan in our lives. Now, almost done. A couple more verses, and I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. His divine power has given us everything we need to live a holy life, a, a, a godly life, to overcome sin, to walk in holiness. We have the authority to do that. Oftentimes, we live in defeat. You know, we, we allow things to, we permit things to exist that we should not. Two more verses. John chapter 14 um, says, and you, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything and I will do it. Go back to Abishai, leaving my son, my oldest son in charge. If I delegate authority to him, when he gives a command, it is in the name of the Father. It's in line with the Father's will. He knows my heart. He knows my expectations. He knows the rules that have been established, that have been left for him. And if anyone fails to obey Abishai, um, it's not Abishai who is going to melt out the judgment and consequences. Think back to the life of Moses. Moses was, a, was God's delegated authority. Anyone who rebelled against Moses and challenged that authority was challenging God's authority because Moses was God's representative authority for the people. So when we challenge human authority that God has established, we are challenging God's authority and God will deal with us. And in those cases, I love those stories. Uh, <clears throat> God said, okay, step aside, Moses. I'm going to take care of these guys. And many of them went to their death as judgment was melted out on those who rebelled against God's authority, God's delegated authority. All right, so to disobey Moses was to disobey God. To disobey a delegated authority is to disobey the source of that authority. That's why a demon cannot disobey the church, the body, because the, if the church, the body is operating in the authority of Christ, in the authority of the head. Last one, Matthew 18. This is familiar to many of you. Truly, I tell you, whatever you, the church, the body of Christ, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done. So this is the power of unity. It's the power of agreement. It's the power of the body. We see here in this passage, if we look at it through the lens of delegated authority, Jesus has said, if, we, if you can just get two people in alignment with one another, in alignment with my will, in submission to Jesus Christ as Lord, with a commitment of obedience, I will grant them my authority, and in my authority, they may bind or loose whatever they ask for. Okay, So, we see the power of the church here, and here are the, I don't know if I included these in the handout or not, but here's some, just a couple questions as we bring this to a close. Are you in submission to God's authority? 
That's the first question we need to ask. Are we in submission to the authority of God, the highest authority, the authority of Christ? Secondly, have we cultivated an intimate knowledge of his will and an obedient heart? The only way we can arrive at an intimate knowledge of his will is to spend diligent time in abundant time in the scriptures and then cultivate a heart of obedience, submission, knowledge of his will, obedience. Um, and after a short introduction to a concept of this magnitude, do you recognize, do you realize um, what delegated authority that we have truly been given? It's the same authority that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. We, Ephesians 2, 6, we have been raised up with Christ. We are in Christ. We are his body. All things are under us. You see how when we turn to Scripture, the Scriptures can really build our faith because they point us to truth. As so we meditate on truth, it, it, it encourages us. It builds our faith to believe for greater things. And number uh, number four, are we willing to exercise that delegated authority under the lordship of Christ as a as a body, as a church? Are we willing to exercise? And even as an individual, are we willing to exercise that authority under the lordship of Christ? We get pushed around way too much. We compromise. We allow the enemy whatever he, whatever attacks he may do in our household uh, on, with those that we love. We should be the master of our house and our every house, every marriage, um, every environment that we set foot in, we should claim for Jesus Christ and exercise the authority that we have been given over any territorial spirits that may try to intervene. Would you be willing to think through the ramifications, the practical ramifications of this concept? And to be aware this week of how you, whether you're driving in the car, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, how you, in fulfilling these three conditions, can exercise the delegated authority for Christ to advance his cause, to advance his mission, um, and to enforce the victory of the cross in your own context. That is the calling of every believer. That is the calling of Livingstone Community Church in this community. Are you willing to embrace it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the scriptures to reveal to us the authority that we have in Christ, the authority of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who lives inside of us. We pray that you would incline our heart to fulfill these conditions of submission, of knowledge of your will and obedience, and that through, not perfect, but through our willingness to, to engage in those things and to allow you to continue to work in us to, to improve, to mature in those three areas, we pray that you would impart upon us as a church, as us as believers, us as married couples, as families, the authority, uh, the resurrection power authority of Christ. And that we, in alignment with your will, can exercise that authority over all things that arise from sin and the curse of sin, as well as uh, over all things demonic or satanic in our lives. We put up with too much for too long. Open our eyes and, and reveal to us, give us discernment to reveal to us where and in what and with who we can exercise this authority for the glory of God, and for the advancement of your cause and your mission here uh, in Colonial Beach. We thank you and we praise you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, God bless.